Good morning. It's Dwayne Hubbard. I'm the music minister at First Methodist Church, and it's my pleasure to be with you again today for our Methodist Moments. Uh, I just really enjoyed being here all week uh, for our morning devotionals at KGAS, and, and then to join you again this morning for our uh, our Bible study. It's, it's going to be, uh, we're beginning a new study today. In it, we're going to look at our real identity. Now, I know if you're like me, you're thinking, oh, I don't want to get all political. I promise. We're not going to get political because it's not about our that kind of identity. It's about our identity as Christians, as followers of the one true God, as um, followers of the God of Jacob and Isaac and Abraham, Abraham of David, Solomon, and in the New Testament, identifying with those followers of the one true God, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Peter, Paul, we identify with them. But to truly identify the, with them, we need to know their story. Um, that's a big part of it. And in this story, we're going to look at a really beautiful um, story in the, in the Old Testament. It's considered by, the, um, by us as, as uh, uh, Christians, we look at the Old Testament and divide it up. We put it as history, as one of the history books. But the Jews actually look at it, Jewish faith looks at it as part of wisdom, along with Psalms and Proverbs. And uh, this story is the basis for one of their um, most important feasts, um, celebrations called Purim. So um, I want to talk a little bit with you about what, um, what we're looking here about uh, this story. The story is the story of Queen Esther. Now, Queen Esther came by way of her crown through a beauty contest. And we go, oh, that's terrible. Yeah. Yeah, it's terrible. But you know, this is thousands of years ago. And we really, we just have to look at it and say, that's the way they did this. But she was a Jewish person, but she had been taken along with all with all of the Jews from from uh, when when uh, Babylon defeated um, Israel and they took the people out and the people that were then dispersed when the Persians defeated the Babylonians and so Queen Esther ended up in the town of in the capital of Persia, Susa, and um, the Persian queen king decided he needed a new queen because the old queen refused to be paraded around in, in front of a bunch of drunks at a party. You kind of respect her, don't you? Well, the king was King Xerxes. This is about 483 BC. Um, and so the, the scriptures tell us that Esther, beautiful Esther, arrived at the palace, went through 12 months of beauty treatments that were prescribed for the women in the, um, in the palace. She was probably somewhere between 14 and 18 years of age. All these things they did were for the sake of the king. It was hoped that the women would find themselves in perfect health, they wouldn't contaminate the monarch or make him sick, sick. And these took place in the seventh year of King Xerxes, according to the book of Esther, 479 BC. And then Esther chapter 2 offers us, offers, us, offers us some background information about Esther. It says that she lost her parents when she was really young. Her cousin Mordecai raised her. Her... Hebrew name was Hadassah, and it, it, pro, it wouldn't be unusual for Jewish people to have a Hebrew name and then have another name taken from the culture. 
where they lived. You know, we know Daniel's name was not Daniel when he was taken into Babylon. Um, I teach students here at Panola who they have one name that is their name in their home country um, in, in uh, Japan or in Nigeria or in France. And their name here is something else. I'm teaching a Paul and a Deborah, but their name, they also have a name from their, their culture. Esther 3 introduces us to Haman. Now, Haman, um, he was a bad guy. And so Haman came, came up with this plot to kill all of the Jews. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. And it was kill all of the Jews. Didn't matter their age, their gender, but all of them. It, it hearkens to the final solution that the Nazis came up with in Germany. That if we would just kill all the Jews, Jews everything would be okay. But today, when the, in the Feast of Purim, when they're observing it, um, when they mention Haman's name, when they say Haman, the people, the Jewish people, stomp their feet and call out, let his name be blotted out. It's their thoughts about Haman. I don't blame them. Um, so we're going to actually pick up the story in chapter 4. Verse 1, when Mordecai learned what had been done, that Haman was wanting to kill all the Jews, he tore his clothes. He dressed in mourning clothes, all black, put ashes on his head. Then he went out into the heart of the city and cried out loudly and bitterly. You may have seen from that, that part of the world, even today, that kind of, a, of, of action in when they're mourning. He went only as far as the king's gate because it was against the law for anyone to pass through it wearing mourning clothes. This practice that, that we see Mordecai doing is how the Jewish people mourned, how they mourn today. Mordecai was in distress. He was worried not just for himself, but for his friends, his family, all the Jews who were taken from their homeland by force and made to live in a foreign country. But it wasn't just Mordecai. Verse 3. At the same time, in every province and place where the king's order and his new law arrived, a very great sadness came over the Jews. They, all of them, gave up eating and spent whole days weeping and crying and crying out loudly in pain. Many Jews lay on the ground in mourning clothes and ashes. Um, when... So just think about that terrible thing. Then as the news spread, the whole country began to mourn. They tore their clothes. They put ashes on their heads as well. The terror, it's terror, is taking over the whole country. Verse 4 and 5, when Esther's female servants and eunuchs came and told her about Mordecai, the queen's whole body showed how upset she was. They didn't know she was a Jew. They had just heard about this guy named Mordecai. So she sent everyday clothes for Mordecai to wear instead of mourning clothes, but he rejected them. Esther then sent for Hathak, one of the royal eunuchs whose job it was to wait on her. She ordered him to go to Mordecai and find out what was going on and why he was acting this way. So Esther's helpers tell her about Mordecai. She was visibly affected, but she has to be careful. She's the queen, but she's hidden the truth about being a Jew. So she sends her most trusted helper to find out what is going on, and he finds out that it's, it's really, really bad. Hathak went out to Mordecai to the city square in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him everything that had happened. To him, He spelled out the exact amount of silver that Haman promised to pay into the royal treasury. 
It was in exchange for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave Hathak a copy of the law made public in Susa, the capital city, concerning the Jews' destruction so that Hathak could show it to Esther and report it to her. Through him, Mordecai ordered her to go to the king to seek his kindness and his help for her people. Hathak came back and told Esther what Mordecai had said. Haman, Haman was a financial supporter of the king. You know, it's surprising what money can buy, isn't it? In exchange for money, he became the second most important person in the country. At least he thought he was. He declared that everyone must bow down to him as well as to the king. Mordecai was a Jew. Like Daniel before him, he was not going to bow down to any earthly king. He identified with God. This made Haman furious. So he decided to kill all the Jews. So could, could Esther help? Not without letting everyone, everyone know that she was a Jew. Could she influence the king? Maybe. She was the truly second most important person in the country. Hathak came back and told Esther what he had learned from Mordecai. How will this end? Stay tuned because we're going to be studying Esther this whole month, five Sundays. In the meantime, we're going to look at a psalm, a psalm, because we may be going through hard times. You, I may be going through hard times right now. We may need some comfort this morning. Uh, you may not know what to do. Maybe you're feeling overwhelmed. You you're not alone. This is Psalm 6, verses 2 through 4 and verse 9. Hope this gives you comfort. Have mercy on me, Lord, David is writing, because I'm frail. Heal me, Lord, because my bones are shaking in terror. My whole body is completely terrified. But you, Lord, how long will this last? Come back to me, Lord. Deliver me. Save me. For the sake of your faithful love, the Lord listened to my request. The Lord accepts my prayer. This is such an honest connection with God. So let God hear your problems. Even though he already knows them, it helps to share them with him. He'll listen. He always accepts them. And add this to your, to your prayer. I, I call it the prayer that never fails. Add, your will be done. Jesus added that to his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. God's will is always done. So next week, we're going to study, continue to study the story of Esther and Mordecai. Evil Haman. Stomp, stomp, let his name be blotted out. King Xerxes, still in the story. All of the other Jews all over Persia. Persia is Iran, by the way. We're still dealing with those folks, aren't we? And the story continues. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for all that you've done for us. We, we know that we become terrified. and We don't know what to do. And we mourn in the ways that we know. But Lord, we know that you already know our story. We know that you're intimately involved in it. We know that you hear us when we call to you. And when we, when we let you know that we don't know what to do. Lord, let your will be done. Lord, comfort us. Hear our prayers. As you heard the prayers of Mordecai and Esther. Listen to our prayers today. In your name we pray. Amen. Look forward to seeing you next Sunday for another of our Methodist Moments.